So hi everyone. Uh, I would like to first express my gratitude to this precious opportunity provided by Glory Sun, Princeton, the UBC, and all the scholars here. Thank you for allowing me to join this group of top scho level scholars together in commemoration of Professor Antonino Fortis' life and work. And a note to my commenter, Professor Galambos, this presentation is slightly modified from the draft that I submitted. So today I'm going to introduce a 9th century trilingual manuscript in Chinese, Japanese, and Sanskrit, but focusing on its presumed printed reconstruction in the 18th century Japan, showing the Edo Japanese's imagination of how Sanskrit was taught in the town China. This paper only marks the beginning of my ongoing study of this text, editions, transmissions, and linguistic issues as a complex. And due to the limit of time and scope here, please excuse me that if the presentation reflect many yet unresolved questions. On February the 6th, 1727, a Japanese yoga monk, Jokumyo, finished his year-long repair of the discovered as his discovery on an excursion east to Saitama, when he by accident grabbed in his hand a broken bamboo box from where the stories began. He recounted the experience in his quasi-diary preface of Strong and the Slight, which I'll now read through due to the limit of time here. But we may pay attention to two crucial places for understanding, which I highlight in yellow on the slide. First, Chuanyan, in Nangzhe Chuanyan, Yi Jing Sanzang Zhi Suo Zhuanyan. So does Chuanyan mean words transmitted from the past sages, Suo Chuan Zhi Yan, or hearsays from the past sages, In other words, whether Chuanyan is a phrase or a disyllabic word defines the nature of the saying that Tripitaka Yi Jing was the one who composed the book. In the former sense, there seemed to have existed scholarship at Jokumyo's time confirming Yi Jing's authorship, while in the latter sense, Jokumyo indicated the incredibility of attributing the authorship to the Tangma. Second, there has been zhongben for him to investigate and demand, so he roughly recovered the correct order of the slips. Here, Zhukumyo seems to confirm the existence of Japanese scholarship on Fan Yu Qian Ziwen in the pre and Edo time, which, although disappeared nowadays, would be worthy to dig into. So from this paragraph, you can see the rough process of Zhukumyo's reconstruction of the manuscript Outside the broken bamboo container, he picked up some worm-eaten pieces, recovered the correct orders of the lines using related editions, and sealed his finished work into a sachet. There was one text prior to Jacumyo's imitation, which may make a more possible base text than our manuscript to be shown today in a while, which is a manuscript written in 1698 which is now preserved at the Faculties of Letters Library, University of Kyoto, is named Fan Zi Qian Zi Wen. And the archive used insect nod, chong sun, chu song, chu, chu song, to describe the manuscript condition matching Jokumyo's description. The archive also report the comp copy completed based upon the manuscript stored in Mount Koya, Dai Local Cloister. There are mistakes in both Sanskrit and Chinese words, as for omissions and misalignments, there's no time to correct them all. I can only amend a few of them with my galloping brush, thus appears so, judged by Yoshitaki at Fuda Local Cloister, Nanjing, which is Mount Koya. Since the paper of our manuscript is in good condition with no insect biting or gluing together, I suspect it's not what Jakumyo worked on. However, although not, let us now, nevertheless, take a look at what the box and this inside look like, because it is the earliest extant manuscript based on radiocarbon technology, which dates the paper and the ink both back to the 9th century. The manuscript is now stored in Toyo Banku, Oriental Library, Tokyo, Japan. From the right to the left, we see the double wrapping of the manuscript. And how do the Edo Japanese print edition look like? This is a copy of Jacumio's woodblock print edition made in 1727, and the copy is pretty rare. Before we get into the content, there's one more player to be introduced who was 50 years later than Jacumio. In, uh, in 1773, 
Another monk, Keiko, revised Jacumio's version. Notably, the Keiko version are what we can find and receive in most of the library collections throughout the world nowadays. So he usually reproduced what Jacumio says and then fill them blanks and then make his own commentary in the form of side notes covering authenticity judgment, philological treatments, and Japanese sound glasses. So we finally come to the insight. You know, the opening is on the right, and then we see the gold foil exposed, and also uh, the preface fully revealed on the manuscript. And pay attention to the corner that it's actually the author's attributed to San Zhang Fa Shi Yi Jing Zhuan. And uh, we could see the preface is attributed, uh, uh, we could see the present form as in the manuscript and uh, as in the side notes, like this yeah and uh, it says this i'm not going to read the translation now but uh one interesting sentence is that it says uh if you study the sedum chapter and practice reading sanskrit at the same time along with this one you'll be able to translate between chinese and sanskrit within two one or two years this is so ambitious of the author wow and um Keiko comment, well, Keiko's comments were simply about moving things around in his eyes or deleting a sentence, but we pay attention to the huoyun, someone says, which seemed to be an indirect statement indicating existence of scholarship again at this time, in contrast with straightforwardly stating guangyun, Keiko says in the next sentence. So after the preface, Jiakong Yo gave five announcements, Fan Li, in his printed edition, further elaborating on many aspects, such as the origin as recorded by Anan, An Ran Lu Zai, and his teacher, Ci Jue Da Shi, Anan Yuan Ren Qing Lai, which is, you know, from China. And also, again, pay attention to Jin Tan Shu Ben and the Xing De Hao Ben that suggest the prevalence of this book. Li Hui Yo Xue, benefiting kids as its function, and also Keigo's commentary on the upper left corner that points out the rhetoric and literary nature of it as a poem. Keiko says, it's a tetrasyllabic on each line. After every 20 tetrasyllabic lines, there comes four pentasyllabic lines. Then, after all these 25 lines, the rhyme changes, marking the start of a new stanza. Actually, in addition to Keiko, there are 10 stanzas in total with 100 characters per section, thus it adds up to 1,000 characters in total. And the 20 characters syllabic in each stanza are usually narratives about one story, while the four pentasyllabic lines serve to recapitulate the theme of the verse. The most important is about uh, Horuji Temple. There are two petrol palm leaves from Central India, and uh, well, the time is almost up. So let us, uh, okay, and this is Keiko's questioning the authenticity and the authorship, talking about how this may be a forgery. Okay, let's step into the main text. So uh, I'm not allowed to go into the code ecology, but this is just to show what the scroll generally looks like. And to enlarge, this shows how the four opening lines look like on the manuscript. The Sanskrit script is called Sidam, Shitan, prevalently used in the 7th century for Buddhist Sanskrit. It died out in India, but was preserved as a form of calligraphic art for Chinese and Japanese for the next millennium. Because Sidam reads from left to right, and Chinese reads from top to bottom, that means we have to first rotate our head clockwise for 90 degrees to read the Sanskrit words and then rotate counterclockwise back to switch to the Chinese text. Makes a good neck exercise in the modern days. But the Edo printed editions, a compilation of little tables, don't have this trouble. And in the early 20th century, when Takakusu Jinjiro compiled the Taishu Shinshu Daizuko, the uh, definitive edition, he assigns the number 2133 to the volume 52 of the Taisho, and the two versions A and B are respectively loyal to the format and layout of the origin, A based on the manuscript and B based on the print edition because they coexisted. 
And the set by Keiko. This text is tetrasyllabic rhyming poem, and the first quatrain look like this. And we can see how this is specially designed as a mnemonic tool for the sinographosphere Han Wenquan habit of memorization, because it features equisyllabicity qi yan and rhyming features ya yun, etc., all special to the literary Chinese language per se, but not a feature of Sanskrit and the inflectional Indo European language. That's why the text was the unique one that drew my interest among the trend of all the foreign language studies, because by being coherent within the Chinese language itself, it pushes its specific appeal to the classically educated Chinese or Japanese audience to the extreme. However, on the Siddham side, it's still a word-by-word -word lexicon just piling up with no grammar at all. What the Chinese text is modeled on the Qianzi Wen reading tradition, I cannot see any Sanskrit grammar. <clears throat> and uh, um, this is even more apparent, more obvious, that there's no phrase structures, no attention paid to allusions. For Xian Jing Zun Shuo De Gui Luo Qi Shen Shi, it's like a compilation of independent words. So this entire text in Kanji, mnemonic tool. Yeah. So the question, does the textual memorizer or recipient really understand the Sanskrit language? And can the student really understand Sanskrit with this pedagogical skill? The first example is the alignment of the text. This is from the beginning of the manuscript and from which we could see between the two big lines, you know, the, there's a small line of sedum inserted in there and the Chinese are pushed aside so everything fit together. So from this, we could see also clearly the formation of the text that the sedum may be, you know, copied in one sit with Chinese added later on, and is further corroborated by the complexity of the Chinese side in cal calligraphy style. We find eight different hands, but only two hands on the sedum side. And the example two is the three basic categories of mistakes in the word boundaries. There are three basic mis, you know, um, uh, ba word boundaries in the uh, text. The first, uh, and uh, we can see a small uh, black dot demarcating two words. And uh, the first one, superfluity, we can say yu, impoverish, adravya is one word, but there's one, you know, extra little thing uh, placed in it as if it's two words. Second, it's omission as in neighborhood, elder, uncle. There should be a uh, demarcator between Parideshi uh, and Jeshta, but there's not. And the third one, misplacement, as in Yoqing, deep feelings. It should be Gambira, Sattva, but now with the misidentified place, then it's Gambi, Rasava, messing up both sides of the words. And uh, this is the manuscript level in the 9th century. What about the Japanese's understanding? Are they better? Well, let's see what Jokumio says with two commentaries. And uh, Keiko, the first one is the same for Keiko. The second one, Keiko says, the four characters, chi, ta, ra, yi, are derived. I'm afraid that they are merely transcriptions. And the main problem with Keiko's commentary is that he treats chi, ta, ra, yi as four independent characters, or zi, rather than a trisyllabic word, si, in two languages, in signifying a common problem in differentiating the two concepts in the Han Wenquan. But in, as for Sanskrit, it's the first step to distinguish between scripts, characters, and words. So the Japanese people did their best, but that was the collective cognition limitation of the archetype, you know, East Asian literary people. So after looking at them, we may be safe to say a no to question of whether their text reflects a good understanding of Sanskrit on both the teaching and the acquisition side. But more precisely, has there ever been a correct understanding? In the received text, the tradition of Japanese learning the scripts and words without the proper understanding of Sanskrit grammar could be dated back to the 1100s to Xinlin Chao or Fan Tang Liangzi, Tian Long Ba Bu Zan, in a similar layout, which I couldn't go into. And uh, 
Wow, am I running out of time? Excuse me, uh, time is running out. Oh. Could you summarize your paper okay. briefly? Yeah. Okay, very quickly, just, yeah, but very quickly, last page. So since this is still an ongoing project, you know, multi-phase investigation, I don't have a conclusion yet, but two problems to point out at the very end. First, this work is completely lost in China and would be very eccentric for the significant pedagogical work to be unmentioned from Yi Jing's over, so famous, or any Chinese histories or hagiographies. The solitary evidence for this text to be preserved, taught, and circulated in Edo, Japan only, may it just be a story around the Kyoto areas and that Japanese people attributed to the town Chinese monk in order to encourage interest in learning the difficult Sanskrit at that time. And second point, there has been linguistic inconsistency on the Indic part because many non-Sanskrit words are mixed in the, you know, Sanskrit, like Bengali, Old Javanese, Prakrit. So it would be very weird for a, is it possible for Yi Jing, if it's truly the author, to intermingle so many non-Sanskrit words arbitrarily into a Sanskrit primer. So yeah, and the, the therefore, okay, to, very quickly, last slides. Uh, coming back to the title page of the slide, how was Sanskrit taught in the town? We may want to modify it to be how was Sanskrit imagined to be taught in the town, or was Sanskrit so-called in the town? And the authenticity of this text will help us understand the reconstruction or even construction and the establishing of identity and learning traditions in the 9th century, 18th century, and our time nowadays. So thank you very much.